Hello everyone, and welcome to the 37th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Asami Yamazaki from Audition. This film is the very definition of a slow burn, one that ends in a brilliant flare of sickening horror. A horror that's perhaps one of the most disturbing scenes you can find in any film. This character is one that provides us with an image of the grave ramifications of child abuse, showing us what can happen to a person's mind when they're brought up in a world of constant terror. In this video, we'll be going through every crucial scene of this fever dream of a film to understand just exactly how a person can develop into a monster like Asami. Along with what we're given in the film, I'll be providing you with information that were presented in the book this film was based on in an effort to understand some of the more ambiguous moments in this film, of which there are many. Without further ado, let's begin. In order to understand who Asami is, and why she reacts in such a horrifying way to the perceived transgressions of Aoyama, we need to piece together what she was exposed to in her childhood from the sporadic scenes that contain fragments of her backstory. To start off, we need to first figure out if the dream sequence we see towards the end of the film is real or just a hallucination. There's a bit of clarity on this issue in the book, as the part of this sequence where he sees Asami at the mercy of her stepfather occurs in a dream after he wakes up from a drugged stupor in the hotel room after Asami left in the book, letting us know that at least there, it's definitely a dream. By that logic, we could assume that everything he experiences in the dream sequence in the film may all be in his head as well. However, the rest of the sequence, including Aoyama investigating Asami's whereabouts, is not in the book, so we can find no clarity for these scenes there. I spent a lot of time watching the behind-the-scenes extras on this film, and searching everywhere I could on the internet for a definitive answer, but I found nothing except theories, so we'll never truly know. In lieu of hard evidence, I'm going to expand upon a notion I discovered from an article by someone named TJ Revis on a PB Works wiki speculating on this dream sequence. Feel free to let me know your own theories down below, as well as something in a corner of the internet that I may have missed in regard to the validity of this dream sequence. I'll provide a link to the article I mentioned in the description if you're interested in reading the entire thing. In one line of this article, TJ asks this question. Is Aoyama in a drug-induced stupor in his apartment all along, listening to Asami describe her past and motive for the metal wire saw action to come? I think the answer to that question is yes. Now we know for sure that Aoyama never actually entered Asami's apartment, and thus is incapable of knowing what it looks like, or what she's been hiding there. So this would be a great way to explain how he's able to visualize it, even if this visualization is meant to show us viewers what's going on, as in reality, he wouldn't be able to see the exact details of Asami's tale in his mind. With this in mind, I think this makes the film all the more enjoyable, as we can assume that everything that happens in these hallucinations in relation to Asami actually happened giving us a sad story of horrible abuse and neglect that shows us how Asami came to be the monster we see in the film. Asami was heavily abused when she was a child. According to her, she was sent off to her aunt and uncle's house after her parents divorced when she was a child, and at their home, she was physically abused by her aunt in several different ways, including being pushed down the stairs. After her doctor became concerned about her, she went back to live with her mother, which only made life exceptionally worse for her. Her stepfather, the terrifying man in the wheelchair, abused her in worse ways than her aunt ever did, as he not only physically abused her, but psychologically, and I assume, sexually as well. And unfortunately for Asami, since her stepfather was disabled, he was always at home, leaving her at his mercy for a good majority of her young life. Though Asami states that ballet was her escape, it also seems to have been just another avenue of torture for her, as her stepfather appears to have been the one who introduced her to the art, becoming her teacher, and her tormentor during these lessons, making her only escape from reality, a fusion of abuse and enlightenment. This caused Asami to develop a strange relationship with her stepfather, one where he was altogether her father, mentor, and torturer, and in tandem with the abuse, he likely encouraged the strange and gruesome behavior she exhibits towards individuals, as a man who would willingly wear prosthetics fashioned from human remains has to be one who's quite depraved himself. To get an idea of what her stepfather feels towards Asami, we need only look to the dream Aoyama has in the novel, which I'd like to read for you now. In a small, shabby room, a man of 50 or so sits on worn tatami mats. He's dressed in long underwear and drinking. He holds a large bottle of cheap whiskey on his knee and pours it into a glass that's cloudy with fingerprints. The man drinks the whiskey slowly and takes deep drags on a cigarette. He has no feet, 
The stubs of his ankles protrude from his long underwear like the ends of oversized sausages. The only thing visible from the room's one small window is the outer wall of the building next door. Gnats are bouncing against a fluorescent light above the table, and one of them has fallen into the man's glass. Furious that he can't stand up and chase the gnats away, he lets out a drunken bellow. Separated from this room by a torn paper screen is an even smaller room with no windows at all. Inside, in the shadows, a little girl is putting on a pair of ballet shoes. The shoes are worn out, scuffed and torn and no longer pink, but a sooty, flesh tone. Once they're snugly on her feet, she stands up. It's summer, and she opens the paper screen slightly to let in a little air. Beads of sweat dot her forehead. What little breeze there is carries the smell of whiskey and cigarette smoke, his smell, mixed with an odor of rotting vegetables. As she's adjusting the screen, the man's expression undergoes a change. His eyes were wild with rage just moments ago, as he grumbled and shouted at the gnats. But now he looks desperate and craven, like a condemned criminal begging for his life. He sets his glass down and glances nervously around behind him, then tries to peer through the partly open doorway. The girl's silhouette flits past the opening as she crosses the dark little room. Her small, slender hands, her underdeveloped chest and hips, her lissom legs, glistening with sweat. The girl knows that the man is watching her and takes care not to give him more than brief glimpses through the opening. He peers down at the stubs of his legs for a moment, then inserts his right hand into his waistband. She's practicing the few simple steps she's mastered, her head tilted at an angle that best emphasizes the beauty of her face, as she's been taught to do at ballet school. She knows what the man is doing with his right hand, and she's seen the thing he's holding. He's been doing this almost every night for the past few weeks, wherever she practices. He doesn't yell at her anymore when she's dancing, or call her names. Instead, he gets drunk and watches her out of the corner of his eye, fumbling in his underwear and looking as if he's about to burst into tears. When she senses him moving that hand and making that face, as if begging for mercy, something evaporates from her body and something else enters to replace it, something dark and indelible. This is sickening to say the least, and though it's said that her stepfather hated her, he also had a pedophilic lust for her that was made all the stranger by his fixation with her dancing, and I imagine that their relationship ended up being an odd mixture of comfort, hatred, and terror. As though Asami seems to loathe her stepfather, even murdering him before Aoyama, she had an attachment to him that partially explains her personality and the strange way she approaches her relationship with Aoyama. Due to the abuse she suffered, she's become outwardly subservient and meek, and her isolation with her stepfather when her mother was absent made her codependent, finding a certain amount of refuge in their relationship. This is all the more apparent when we see that Asami has been living in the same dilapidated apartment since her childhood, an apartment she still shares with her stepfather. This, in tandem with her inability to hold down a stable job, and the way she spends her time doing absolutely nothing, shows us that Asami was unable to properly acclimate to society due to the abuse she suffered, and chose to remain with her stepfather, who, in a very terrible way, was the closest person to her, her only source of comfort and security. Her love-hate relationship with ballet also explains why we always see her in white, at least in the film, as she once again defaults to the appearance she found comforting. These components of Asami's upbringing explain why Asami has grown into a highly volatile and emotionally compromised woman, and to understand why Asami acts the way she does towards men, we have another passage from the book that outlines this part of her psyche perfectly. It was about Shige. She hadn't been able to accept or forgive the fact that Aoyama had a son whom he adored. Nor had Yamazaki Asami ever overcome, as Aoyama had believed, the trauma of being raised by a stepfather who beat and abused and reviled her. She still carried that trauma, still lived with it every day. Any man who betrayed or lied to her was the same as her stepfather. Therefore, according to her reasoning, such men should have their feet severed to resemble him more closely. Now the only other maiming of a man that we know of at least in the film, is the one who she keeps in a sack, which is undoubtedly Mr. Shibata, her supposed mentor from a record label. However, with all we know about Asami, he was more than likely a lover rather than a mentor, one who she probably met in much the same way she met Aoyama, and the woman who she murdered at the Stonefish Bar was probably not a friend or a boss, but a woman who Mr. Shibata was cheating on her with. Once she discovered his infidelity, she tracked them down to this bar, maiming Mr. Shibata and murdering the woman 
before absconding with Mr. Shibata back to her apartment, where she fashioned her stepfather's gruesome prosthetics. All of these things give us a clear picture as to why Asami is who she is, and why she assaults and tortures Aoyama in such a brutal way. Though this entire scene is unsettling, perhaps the most terrifying aspect of her behavior here is how devoid of emotion she is for most of it. Emotion that's intermixed with a childlike playfulness as she inserts the needles into his skin, and the absolute glee on her face as she saws through Aoyama's foot. In the end, she rightfully gets what she deserves at the hands of Shige, bringing an end to a horrifically tragic life. And at this end, who was Asami Yamazaki? She was a little girl who went through a veritable hell of physical, psychological, and sexual abuse. Abuse that caused irreparable damage to her psyche, leaving her a broken and disturbed individual that operated on the fringes of society. What happened to Asami was in no way her fault, and the evil of her family, particularly her stepfather, are the most to blame for who she developed into. However, this in no way excuses the deliberate and nefarious actions of a woman who sought to bring the maximum amount of pain she could imagine to those who she believed had wronged her. And though we can sympathize with her childhood and condemn the actions of her family, the sickening and depraved actions of Asami transform her from an innocent victim of abuse to a psychotic woman who's taken her abuse and projected it tenfold onto those she deems to be liars, whether they are or not, torturing them with a cruel intent and unabashed sadism that leaves her as nothing more than yet another soul caught firmly in the grasp of evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Asami? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you liked this video and want to see more like it appearing in your feed, click the subscribe button to keep up on the latest episodes, and feel free to leave a like while you're at it. Thank you once again to all of my existing subscribers for your continued and incredible support. If you'd like to support the channel even further, consider signing up as a patron over on Patreon. You can find a link to Patreon down in the description. Thank you to everyone who signed up so far, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed in the description for occasional updates on the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.